Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest on the line this morning. We have Jennifer Carol Foy. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? And, I, and I'm asking that sincerely. How, how are you? I'm doing well. I feel good. I've been working hard, fighting for 15 months, and, you know, we're just less than, you know, a couple hours away from our election. Running for governor of Virginia. Goober National, right? What, what does that mean? Yeah, that means I'll lead this commonwealth uh, in the cradle of the Confederacy. We're about to elect the first black woman governor in the history of our country. Wow. You know what's so interesting? You come highly, um, highly recommended. My man Carlos Watson was like, yo, you have to have Jennifer Carol Foy on. She's amazing. She's about to be the first black woman governor in the country. And I was like, yeah, sure. And, and you're an HBCU alumni? That's right. Hell State. Okay. So what do you plan to do for HBCUs in Virginia? Let's, let's start there. So graduating from Virginia State University, uh, one of the best HBCUs in the country. Um, not only did I graduate from there, but I also taught there as well, because I know the black excellence that our HBCUs produce in teaching and nursing and medicine and engineering and you name it. So I wanted to give back as much as I could. And so as governor, I'll make sure to make our, re our HBCUs research and development university so we can draw down those federal funds and the next best great idea or invention happens at an HBCU. Uh, also addressing that gap that we have. We have kids dropping out of our HBCUs uh, because they are having debt but no degree because the amount of tuition, room and board, books, costs more than the amounts of loans and grants that they're eligible for. So making sure that we can keep our kids in schools, that's what's most important to me. So increasing financial aid is tops. And I have to say capital improvements as well. You know, I talked to the president at Norfolk State University and she explained to me, Jen, our science building is crumbling, literally, not figuratively. So we need some dollars and I am gonna show up in a big way. As a state legislator, I already help put forth a budget that gave historic amounts of money to our HBCUs. And I'm going to continue to do that as governor. Now I was going to ask you, you know, Virginia has uh, known to be a, a very racist place. Um, a lot of things that they do doesn't necessarily benefit our community. How do we start to change that? I went to Hampton University, so I've seen it from early on. Um, and I just remember, I mean, that's part of the reason why people don't go, you know, because 4th of July was big in Virginia Beach. Like, everybody used to go to Virginia Beach, but... They kind of boxed this out and we had to move to Miami. So what can we do to, to, to stop all that racism that, that is so strong in Virginia? So we have to change the people in positions of power. That's number one. Um, because when you have people who went to church, we went to church, went to our schools, breathed our air, walked our streets, lived in our communities that have long been ignored, neglected, and left behind, you know, they're gonna put policies in place that's gonna uplift our communities in a real way. So that's what we have to start. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I'm running for, for governor. I was born and raised in Petersburg, Virginia. It used to be an affluent and well-to-do African-American community. But when jobs left, businesses closed in despair, high child poverty, uh, high crime rates, they all crept in. And politicians of the past turned their backs on us. And, you know, we had to fight and fend for ourselves. But luckily, you know, we are a strong and resourceful people. And we've been able to do that. But we're not looking for a hand out. We're looking for a hand up, someone who's going to fight for us. So that's why I became a public defender, a foster mom, community organizer, and a state legislator, by being able to pass bills to reduce the Black maternal mortality rate, right, where Black women are four times more likely to die during childbirth. And I almost became one of those statistics as well, because I wasn't seen, I wasn't believed, and I wasn't heard. Um, helped pass the bill to prohibit the use of chokeholds by police officers, so we don't have an Eric Garner situation in Virginia, um, diversifying a teacher workforce because statistics show that if a black child has a teacher that looks like him or her, they are more likely to graduate from high school and go on to college. The reason we've been, I've been able to pass these bills and budgets is because people have believed in me and the messaging in this campaign and we're going to make it bigger and better as, as governor. What do you think, um, I mean, why do you think your, your campaign is so quiet? Because I think about the last two you know, b brilliant black people who had an opportunity to to take over as governor, Miss Stacey Abrams and, you know, brother Andrew Gillum. Like, why do you think those, those seem like those were like made a lot of noise? Why do you think your campaign has been so quiet? 
I think that the media has uh, been slow to pay attention to the race and governor because there has been a lot going on. I mean, 2020 was tragic, right? It took us through it. And then we had to fight for the White House. We had to win Congress and people, you know, media donors, voters, they've been exhausted. People are just now starting to tune in to this race in the last couple of weeks. And it's perfect time because we have the mobilization, the messaging, the people, the wind to our backs and, you know, the excitement and energy that's gonna help us win this. But, you know, those candidates, Andrew Gilliam and Stacey Abrams and all of them, they laid the foundation and built the framework for other campaigns to build. And we're starting a movement. I anticipate in 2022, there are going to be Black men and women running for governor and higher positions all over this country because it's reverberating that you can't just thank Black people for delivering the White House and Congress. You have to support us when we're ready to lead. And we should be where all the decisions are being made. We don't just need bills and budgets written for Black women. We need them written by Black women. Mm. And we're going to be heard from today. Now, Commonwealth, when you say the Commonwealth of Virginia, right, doesn't that usually mean the people make and govern their own laws? Is that similar to what it means? That's pretty much what it is. It's for the common good. It's for uh, the people being the voice of of the community um, and pretty much sums it up. But people are really, uh, you know, particular about being a commonwealth. I was going to ask about that. So why is it that Virginia is a commonwealth? And because I was always taught that when you say commonwealth, it's usually the white people that are governing Virginia. So it's nothing in our benefit when it comes to Virginia. Well, that's the history of this country, right? And mm-hmm. the people who traditionally been in power have not been us. But that's why we're breaking down barriers and blazing trails where none existed. You know, one of the challenges even right now is the conversation about inevitability, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, people tuning into campaigns, they believe that people who have been in power will inevitably be, be in power again. And it's not lost on me that when people tune in to this campaign, they see me a woman with black skin and ambitious ideas trying to be the next governor in the former cradle and and capital of the Confederacy. But I like to remind people that it was inevitable that a certain type of person would be president until Barack Obama and Shirley Chisholm raised their hands. Mm -hmm. It was inevitable that only men would go into space until Sally Ragg got on that rocket ship. So inevitability only exists if we allow it. But if our voices come together, we show up at the polls on June 8th uh, between 6 a.m. to 7 p.m., then I'm telling you that we're going to change what this commonwealth and what inevitability really looks like. How how would you define the current political landscape after after Trump? I define it as uh, divisive, you know. Both political parties have kind of gone to their respective corners. Um, Some people see any type of compromise or negotiation as, you know, treasonous. And we have to get back to that space where, you know, it's the art of negotiation. You give a little something, I give a little something. But at the end of the day, the job is to get the job done. So being one of the first women to ever graduate from Virginia Military Institute, one of the top military colleges in this country, it taught me that. Like, it doesn't matter how this person worship, who they love, where they come from. You know, people are dying. People are hurting based upon what we do or we don't do. And that's what's most important. But, you know, we are in a place where facts don't matter, where, you know, people don't care. It's all about self-preservation. And what I'm hearing from Virginia voters is that they're frustrated with the partisan politics and divisive rhetoric. And they just want people who are going to get things done and improve their quality of life. And that's why I'm running. Man, that, what you said is so true, man. We really do live in an era where nobody cares about facts anymore. Like they will literally just ignore facts to move on what it is that they feel. And I think that that's that's a problem because if you're a politician who's I always say Republicans are are more sincere about their lies than Democrats are about their truth. So if it sounds if it sounds like a fact, they'll run with it. And Democrats just don't do a good job of like being sincere about what the truth is. Yeah, I mean, that's that is true. You know, Democrats fall in love. Republicans fall in line. And that's Mm. just that's just what it is. And we have to work so much harder to get our people out, Um, you know, and that's you know, that's what makes these campaigns a little bit more challenging, a little bit more difficult. And Republicans are very much great messengers. They're very good at, you know, being true to what it is. Right now, they, they're not even pretending to care. They're like, yep, 
We trying to jam- gerrymander y'all. Yeah, we're trying to make sure we stay in power. Don't care if y'all can vote. They don't care if their own people can vote. And so that's you know what's really tragic about this political climate right now. But that's why it's going to take new leadership to step up and make a change. You know, in the words of my aunt, if you want something done right and done once, have a woman do it, mm. Um, mm. especially a black woman. So that's what this is. We're going to change the messaging. We're going to change the momentum. We're going to change the way things are being done because people need help and they need help now. I like something your grandmother uh, said, too. I read that she said, if you have it, you have to give it. And that's that's something I learned from my grandmother. So I, I just want to know what that means, what that means to you. It means that my job is to house the homeless and to feed the hungry. Right. So I grew up in a southern Christian household by my grandparents. My grandmother had me in church three whole days a week. Right. And so I just remember seeing her give all that she could, even though we didn't have much. You know, she worked at Central State Mental Health Hospital. She volunteered in our community, even let people from our church who fell on hard times come live with us until they got back on their feet. I thought that's what everyone did. So it was nothing to me to dedicate my life to service because, you know, as the saying goes, service is the uh, payment that you pay for your time here on earth. And I sincerely believe that. So it's about giving back, uplifting people. You know, I mean, I have much, but there's always people who have less than me. Show me how you treat the the people least amongst you and I'll show you who you really are. That's what moves me. And that's why I go into that courtroom every day fighting you know, for people constitutional rights, people 100% below the poverty line. That's why I became a foster mom for almost 10 years um, and a community organizer because I live this, I breathe this. I'm in the trenches doing the good work and that's what we need. I look forward to seeing the first black woman governor in the U.S. Oh. Uh, in Virginia. I look forward to seeing that. Now, what about gun laws? You know, um, Virginia is definitely a town where it, it's, it's not that difficult to purchase a firearm. So what, what are your stance on, on some of these gun laws? So we are the place where, you know, Virginia Beach happened, mass shooting and Virginia Tech happened as well. Um, You know, there's a woman named Deshayla Harris. She was just shot and killed and her family is still looking for answers. You know, no parent should outlive their child or know what it's like to bury a child, especially do something preventable like gun violence. We have enough weapons to arm every man, woman and child three times over. It's easier to get a gun than it is to get a job in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And that's one of our biggest challenges. And so many people are like, well, why can't we figure out the answer to this? And it's because you need people who understand, who's come from a community where gunshots, you know, lulling you to sleep at night is nothing new. Mm -hmm. Having a friend that was shot is my story. And having to, you know, pray that he made it through the night because he was about to be robbed. And when he stood up, he was shot down multiple times. So I'm going to treat this with a sense of urgency and have assault weapons banned so we can get the weapons of war off our streets. Mm. That's what's important. But I'll also invest in balanced interruption programs because we have to ensure that we're uplifting the communities that's been most affected by gun violence. Gun violence, you're not going to address in a real way unless you get to the root of the issue, which is really poverty. And so people had real jobs and economic opportunity and paid family leave and paid sick days and went to well-funded schools, you know, and we keep the family unit together, we wouldn't have so many of the issues that we have. But there were intentional racist policies that were put in place, not only here in the Commonwealth, but throughout this country that we're still feeling the effects and seeing the ramifications of. So if no one's talking about getting to the root cause, then don't talk to me because you're just trying to nibble at the edges and put you know, band-aids on our issues, getting us from one crisis to the next. That's why we need a bold transformational leader who is unafraid to speak the truth, speak truth to power, make it plain, and then pass bills and budgets that's going to uplift our community. So if you had, if you had your your number one thing on your agenda is, is uh, economic empowerment. Absolutely. That's what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said. Unless we have that, we don't have anything. That is the real route to to equality, not just equality, but equity. So it's about the $15 minimum wage. It's about paid family le- medical leave, paid sick days. Because let's be real, black and brown people are on the front lines of this virus because we make up the majority of the industries that's been hit hardest by COVID, retail, entertainment, tourism. And it's gonna take us longer to recover because it's gonna take longer for those industries to recover. But if we were able to afford to go to college, to get those degrees that's in nanotech and robotics and all of those things, that's what we need to start preparing our, our, our 
skilled workers for, not necessarily all, all blue collar jobs, but new collar jobs. I'm looking to the future on how we are going to address redlining, mass incarceration, land and wage theft. I already started that work as a state legislator, ending pregnancy discrimination, ending wage theft, prevailing wage for contractors, diversifying our teacher workforce. But we have to do more, but I need to be you know, governor on June 8th, and that's why I need everyone to vote so we can make it happen. You know, you know Jennifer, right. you're from Petersburg. And um, I, I remember, I don't, I don't know if it still is, but Petersburg, Petersburg was like one of the most dangerous places to live, like in all of Virginia at, at one point. So how did you, how did you make it up? I, I learned how to duck and dodge. Now, I'm, <laughs> listen, it, I love my city, you know, but the facts are the facts. We have one of the highest child poverty rates, rates mm -hmm. of unaccredited schools, rates of gun violence. Um, and I say that, you know, you make it out of Petersburg, it speaks to who you are as a person. But Petersburg is reflective of so many other communities, not only across this Commonwealth, but about uh, throughout this country, where we're just surviving, right? If you make it to tomorrow, then that's a win. I have some friends who, when we were in high school, and I talked to them about what college you want to go to, they're like, I'm just trying to make it to the age of 19, Jan. You know, I mean, it's just those are the real conversations that black and brown people in the communities that have been left behind have. And when we turn to politicians of the past who would come during campaign season and make promises to be big and bold, they turn their backs on us. They were nowhere to be found. And that's why it takes one of us to, you know, embrace our communities who come from where we come from, who's going to really fight for us and ensure that we're not left behind. Do you think with so many HBCUs in Virginia that, you know, students should be able to go to school for free? I mean, because there's so many of them, depending on how much their parents make or how much their income is. I mean, there's there's so many HBCUs in Virginia that students shouldn't have a problem getting an education. Oh, absolutely. I totally agree with that. And that is one of the platforms that I'm going to push as governor. You know, as far as the G3 program, get a skill, get a job, give back, already helped to fund. And as governor, I'll continue to make more robust the program to make two years of community college pretty much free for low to moderate income Virginians to go to community college and major in a high demand area like uh, nursing or early childhood education, computer science, information technology, and I'll add renewable energy majors to that as well. And then expanding that to our HBCUs is exactly what I'm going to do. Well, get out there and vote. That's right. June 8th. I, I really hope on June 9th, you know, they're announcing that Jennifer Carol Foy is the governor of Virginia. That just would be amazing. So I my, my, guess my final question is like, what would that mean to you to be the first black woman governor in the country? It would mean the fact that we are breaking down barriers and blazing trails. But this is nothing new to me. I'm not new to this at all. You know, being the first public defender ever elected to the Virginia General Assembly, the first woman, one of the first women to graduate from Virginia Military Institute, and one of the and the first woman to run a race while pregnant with twins, being outraised and out endorsed and still winning wow. my legislative seat. I play no games. So I'm here to ensure that we make this one happen on June 8th. And I need everyone to go to my website at jennifercarolfoy.com. And please do your homework research because I need your vote. I need you to show up and I need you to show out for Jennifer Carol Foy for governor on June 8th. All Thank right. you, Ms. Foy. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right, All right now.